Hi, and welcome to Sea Tide, Faster Constantine Seaside. So what is Seaside? Seaside is a post-quantum key exchange protocol that is based on a group action on a certain set of elliptic curves. The secret keys, sampled from some key space, give group elements, and then we use the group elements to evaluate the group action to obtain public keys. What is CTIDE? CTIDE is a new key space and a new algorithm to compute the group action in CSIDE. Moreover, our new algorithm is constant time and we verify this claim using, using Valgrind. In addition, we obtain significant speedups as compared to the previous best constant time implementations. So let's get started on Seaside. In Seaside, we use elliptic curves over a finite field FP, where P is chosen in a very special form. Then there is some mysterious abelian group acting on the set of elliptic curves in Seaside. Uh, all we need to know is that all these curves are represented by a Montgomery form, so we only need to keep track of this A coefficient. Then by construction in Seaside, for every one of these primes Li, we have a group element in the mysterious group, such that evaluating the group action can be done very efficiently using Li isogenies. You can think of the group action as starting from one elliptic curve and by acting being transported to a new elliptic curve. And isogenies are maps of elliptic curve. So starting from one curve, you map to another elliptic curve. And then the group action that we need to evaluate in Seaside is given by composing these small elements GI that we know how to act with efficiently to get more group elements to act with. Moreover, we want to evaluate this group action in constant time. And what does it mean? We want to evaluate the group action in a way that the timing of the algorithm does not provide any information about the private key and does not provide information about the output. So that will be the goal for the constant time claims in this talk. First, we start with the new key space. Like I said, the group action that we want to compute, we want to compute the action by the small elements GI taken EI, EI times. So this information is captured in an exponent vector, which is just an integer vector. And these exponent vectors are sampled from, sampled from some key space, and we just need a key space to be large enough. In the original Seaside paper, you just take the same bound for every entry of the vector, bearing in mind that the resulting key space needs to be large enough. Sometimes you, you may want to only allow non-negative entries in your exponent vectors. And also because evaluation of the group action by GI for different i's takes a different uh, amount of effort, it's very useful to allow the bounds to vary for uh, the bounds on the different entries of the vector to vary for efficiency. And now I'm going to explain to you how to uh, how we change the key space in C type. So for concreteness, we just take the C side 512 prime uh, just to have some some numbers. So for every prime, there is a group element, and uh, we can look at the corresponding entry in the exponent vector. And then we batch these primes together. So we just pick any um, uh, and a splitting of the of the set of primes, uh, and we consider all these uh, all these primes as one batch. So we take them together, and then we notice that this exponent vector is actually in the subset in which uh, in the subset of vectors, integer vectors, in which we compute exactly three isogenies 
three group actions for primes in this batch, and in, in which we compute exactly five isogenies, five group actions for primes in this batch, and so on. To get a larger key space, we also know that this same exponent vector is in the subset where we compute up to three isogenies in, in this batch, up to five isogenies in this batch, and so on. So this is our resulting new key space. And uh, it's not at all clear how this speeds up any of the computation. But the other, the second contribution of C-type is that we also change the algorithm to compute the group action evaluation in a way that we can really evaluate the group action for any prime in the batch efficiently. But to explain this, I first need to tell you how the group action is uh, evaluated in general. So this is where the isogeny magic comes. So remember, for all of these uh, small primes Li, we have group elements that we can act with efficiently. And the group action is taking you from one curve to another. Uh, to get to isogenies, uh, we know that this action is evaluated uh, using isogenies that also take you from one curve to another. And isogenies are algebraic maps of elliptic curves. That is, if I have two elliptic curves, then the map is given by some rational functions. But they're also homomorphisms of groups. So if I have a point on an elliptic curve, then it gets mapped to another point on the new elliptic curve. And the special property that we will be using that's inherent to C-side is that if I take a point whose order is a multiple of Li, then if I evaluate it under the isogeny, I drop the Li in the order. Okay. So uh, the group action is given by isogenies, and now I'm going to give you more details on how to compute the group action. There are two steps. First, we find a point of order L uh, on the first elliptic curve. And then we compute the isogeny with the kernel, that point of order L. The first step uh, to finding the point, one easy way to do it is to just generate a random point of order P plus one, and then, uh, which is rather easy, and then we multiply it by uh, by a suitable factor to get a point of exact order L. In the second step, computing the isogeny also splits into uh, three different steps, depending on uh, whether you use the value formulas or the spared value formulas. Uh, but in any case, we always enumerate some multiples of the point. Then we construct a polynomial that iterates over these multiples and takes the x-coordinate. And then from this H polynomial, we somehow compute the coefficient of the new curve. The second part is really efficient. The second step, all of it takes less than a six L multiplications in FP. But the first part is the crux of the matter because here is a very large scale multiplication. If the prime that we start with is a 500-bit is prime, and maybe we need to use larger primes for C-side, then this scalar multiplication is going to be really much more costly than whatever happens in this intricate second step. The way to get around this is to compute the group action by several elements in one go and hence only have to use this uh, uh, costly scalar multiplication once. What do I mean by that? Let's just do it on an example. Suppose we want to evaluate the exponent vector 1, 1, 1, which means that we want to compute the 3, 5, and 7 isogeny. Then the procedure is similar. We first find a suitable point, and then we compute the isogenies. But this time, instead of finding 
points of order 3, 5, and 7, we find a point of order 3 times 5 times 7. So from this uh, costly multiplication, we get a point of order 3, 5, 7, 3 times 5 times 7. And then if we compute the isogenies, we only ever have to do small scale multiplications to get the correct points of order 3, 5. And we also use that we can cheaply evaluate isogenies on points. And if we evaluate the isogeny on a point of order T1, which had exact order 3, 5, 7, then the resulting point drops the 3 in the order and has, point, uh, has order 5 times 7. So in this way, we replace three very large scale multiplications by one large scale multiplication, two very small ones, and two rather cheap point evaluations. And this is the way we evaluate isogenies, uh, isogeny action, always as a sequence of isogenies and pushing points through. The one disadvantage is that if you look at the timing, you can immediately tell that you computed a 3, 5, and a 7 isogeny because you know how, how long these individual steps take. Fortunately, it's very easy to adjust this algorithm or this procedure to not reveal which of the isogenies we computed. Okay, so how do we do that? Suppose we want to, again, evaluate the 3 and 7 isogeny, but no 5 isogeny. The only thing that changes is that for the 5 isogeny, where we still do the same thing as before, but now we throw away the results. And remember, the group action was moving from one curve to another. So if we stay on the same curve, then it's the same as not computing the group action. But to fit into the flow, we need to make sure that the next step receives a point of correct order. So that's why we use, we add a small, uh, small line of code to always compute the correct multiple. Because then if you check it, this multiple then has the correct order and you can use it in the next step. So in this very simple way, albeit using uh, dummy uh, operations, uh, you can turn the code that computes a 3, 5 and 7 isogeny into a code, a piece of code that computes any subset of these 3, 5 and 7 isogenies with the same timing. And in our paper, we formalize this into atomic blocks. So an atomic block is a probabilistic algorithm that uh, computes the group action for any subset of indices in the exponent vector in a way <clears throat> that the time of uh, the time distribution uh, of the algorithm does not depend on the actual on the input so it does not depend on which curve you start with and it does not depend on uh, whether you choose zeros or, or ones for the exponents but it only depends on the subset of the isogeny degrees that you were willing to compute so this might be a complicated definition but we already saw it on the previous slide we saw a way how to build an atomic block that always computed the three, five, seven isogenies, so the action by the first three elements, in a way that didn't leak whether we actually computed or did not compute the isogeny. And once you have atomic blocks, uh, it's actually rather easy to turn it into a constant time, uh, constant time algorithm that computes the group action in C side. And so these atomic blocks are a way to formalize the previous approaches to constant time isogen implementation. Okay, so now how do we use these, how do we use this all computation with batching? So remember that for atomic blocks, we need to make sure that the information, the only information, the timing only depends on uh, which of the uh, which of the actions we're computing, 
and doesn't leak information about anything else. But with batches, there's one extra piece of information. We also need to we're, we also need to protect which of the isogenies in the batch we use. Okay. So uh, let me just give you the algorithm on how to extend what we just had, the computation for uh, uh, isogenies in batches, and then tell you what we need to fix. So again, if you want to compute isogenies using batches, then we need to find a suitable point, and we can make it so that the point uh, has order that only depends on the batches and not on the, the individual primes. Then uh, again, we need to take some, uh, some scalar multiples. Uh, and in most of the steps, we can make it so that the procedures only depend on the batches. But you see that there's a bunch of uh, scalar multiplications that depend on which prime in the batch we chose. And then there are isogeny evaluations that also depend on the isogeny, the, the actual degree that we chose. So those are, those are the steps in red. Fixing the scale multiplication is easy because with very small overhead, we can just uh, do it. Uh, we can just multiply by all the primes in the batch. And the multiplying by the chosen prime is done as a dummy operation. So that's with very small overhead. But how do we fix this five isogeny and this 11 isogeny? How do, we, how do we do it so that this computation is the same for all primes in the batch in a way, uh, in an efficient way? We could also just compute the three, the five, and the seven isogeny somehow um, and throw away the results, but that would be very inefficient. So the answer to that is the Matryoshka isogeny. And to explain it, Again, we go into what actually happens when we're computing these isogenies. So to compute an 11 isogeny, we need to enumerate some multiples of the point. We construct some polynomial, which is the product of linear factors that uh, are taken from the x-coordinates of the points in step one. And then from, from this uh, polynomial, we somehow somehow derive this A coefficient. Well, but if, we, if we're computing 13 isogeny instead, we only need to add one multiple and we only need to multiply by one extra linear factor. If we do a 17 isogeny, then we need to add two more multiples and we need to uh, multiply by two uh, more linear factors. Or the other way around, if we're computing a seven isogeny, the code already computes everything that is needed to compute an 11 isogeny or a 13 isogeny. So for the primes in the batch, we can compute an isogeny for any prime in the batch at the cost of the largest prime, at the cost of uh, uh, using dummy, dummy operations. Uh, this Matryoshka property of isogenies that they somehow uh, you just you can just keep adding things to compute isogenies with larger degree. And this was already already known. Uh, what is new is that we noticed that this property is also for the new value square root formulas. And the reason why we're getting these speedups is that we realize that it's actually this actually works well with batching. Because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to pay the cost for an I, for a small isogeny at the cost of a large prime isogeny. But if you have batches, then if the primes in the batch have similar size, then paying the cost for a slightly larger prime is not such a big overhead. But of course, now you need to know how how to how to set it up so that these prime and so that these batches. Um, actually give you the efficiency. Well, in general, we don't know how to set up uh, batches efficiently. We don't know how to sell, sell, uh, set it up because it looks like a very complicated uh, optimization problem. But what we can do, we can estimate the cost of the whole uh, group action evaluation 
for any batch configuration. So if you tell us, uh, if we set up the number of batches or split the primes into batches, and we uh, give the bounds for each batch, then we can give a pretty accurate estimate of what the resulting cost will be. And then we can use this cost function uh, to do a greedy algorithm to start from some configuration and adaptively try to change it so that uh, we get a configuration with a smaller cost. And this way, uh, we arrive, for instance, at the, uh, this is our best, uh, current best batch, batching for Seaside 512. Uh, you see that the primes uh, in one batch are usually pretty close to each other so that there's no big overhead. Remember that in batching, you pay the cost for the smallest isogeny is the same as the cost for the largest isogeny. That's why the, the first batches with small primes are rather small. Uh, and then uh, you see that the batches get larger uh, as the primes increase. And the one prime that's a lot larger than, than all the other primes is isolated because you don't want to pay the cost uh, for this prime already for these smaller primes. Okay. We also claim that our algorithm is constant time. And uh, beyond just uh, understanding atomic blocks and uh, having conceptually uh, good ideas about how constant time should look like, we also use Valgrind to check it. So what can Valgrind do for us? We can uh, check whether there's any flow from the secret data to any branches or any uh, arrow indices. Okay, so if you uh, if you just execute your data, then the secret data might impact somehow the code execution. But if you declare them as undefined in Valgrind, then if they actually do impact the code execution, then Valgrind will complain, and then you can do a manual check and see what's happening with your code and fix it. So if uh, if uh, you do these checks uh, with Valgrind, then you can have a pretty solid um, um, confirmation that, that your code uh, does not leak timing information uh, about secret data. Finally, let's talk about the speed of our, uh, of our Seaside software. The green lines are the new Seaside uh, algorithm and uh, here how to read the table. Uh, this is the size of the prime, this is the size of the public key, and depending on one or two in the third column, we either do the group evaluation or also uh, public key validation for the whole, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Seaside protocol. And you see that uh, if you count the number of multiplications, squarings, and additions, and depending on how you, um, how you want to uh, uh, how you estimate the relative cost. Uh, every time we get uh, significant speed ups compared to the com compared to previous uh, constant time implementations. We also uh, we also measure the cycles uh, on Skylake, and even there we also have a uh, have a significant improvement. So to sum up, what is C type? C-Tide is a new key space for Seaside using batching. C-Tide is a new constant time algorithm to evaluate the group action using the Matryoshka isogenies. In C-Tide, we also formalize atomic blocks. So we formalize the evaluation of the group action as a sequence of isogenies. We verify our constant time claims using bulk grind, and we obtain significant speed records. And you can see our article and you can get, most of all, you can get the code at our website. Thank you.